oh hey, bring a bat. I thought of throwing some scientific papers as well. <laughs> There's a one thing really telling you what you can find on Google. So I was looking down scientific papers to see that, okay, what, what? And there's so many studies as you can imagine. So I'm not going to bore you with too many. So I just picked up three interesting papers that I thought would be, that I'll like share with you guys. Okay, so this is 2017 in the Vet Science um, Journal. Inaccurate assessment of canine body condition score, body weight, and pet food labels, a potential cause for inaccurate feeding. So we can talk about everything about what is in a diet, what sort of diet you're going to give. This is the paper that they did. Okay, it's quite interesting. 11% of owners overestimate body condition score and 19% overestimate body weight. Only 48% of owners could correctly estimate their dog's body weight. It's interesting because we know how much we feed is how much we think the dog needs. How accurate is our thinking in how much the dog needs? And this was the results. Okay, only 23% and 43% of owners could correctly estimate how much wet and dry food to feed respectively. Only a fifth, or almost a quarter, and almost half, they could estimate how much wet to dry food. Okay, many owners are not aware of their pet's body condition and body weight and cannot accurately interpret pet food labels. It is quite interesting how I see a lot of different owners who say, oh yeah, I've changed the food, I'm feeling the same amount. Okay, if you change the food, how can you be feeling the same amount? <laughs> is that if that food is super energy dense and this food is not, you may have to feed a little bit more of this or the other way around. But he's always had 400 grams. Okay, of what? <laughs> of kibble. Okay, which kibble? <laughs> different food. Okay, so it's quite interesting that our perception is not actually as accurate as it is. So further owner or education to improve these skills is needed if dogs are to be fed correctly. So, you know, we can choose whatever diet we want really and read whatever labels we want if we even read them. But this is the study that they actually show how much dogs are actually eating adequately in terms of what the owner feels should be given to the dog. And just to elaborate a little bit on body condition. So I am a big fan of body condition score. Body weight, boring. Okay, that is just a number. It's just like me trying to tell a five foot six woman how much she should weigh. God forbid. <laughs> They're all different shapes. They're all different shapes. So body condition score is the way to go. And if you get the body condition, uh, the body condition score right, that weight is the weight for that dog, and only for that dog. Don't tell me every Dalmatian should be like this, or every Labrador should be like this. It's not okay. And just to illustrate a little bit more, body condition scoring we tend to gauge it. There's a lot of different scores out there. The one which I personally use is one to nine. So one being initiated, nine being grossly obese, four and five being ideal for dogs. Yep, so four and five being ideal. So what does five look like? So I tend to go by three different things. Five looks like you cannot really see the ribs, but if you feel it, you can feel it almost instantly. Very, very thin layer of fats between your fingers and the ribs. But you can't really see the ribs. You can see the ribs from a distance, maybe it's a little bit on a three out of nine, so to speak. Okay, so that's one. Not seeing the ribs, but feeling the ribs quite easily. Secondly, looking from the top. Okay, the dog is facing that way. You're going to see a nice chest and a waist sloping in. You can see the difference between a chest and a waist. If it's torpedo shape or cigar <laughs> shape, uh, maybe not so good. Okay, so that's that. From the side, okay, you're going to see a chest and a tummy tuck. Okay, so if the it's completely flat, chest and tummy, there's no tummy tuck at all, um, then that could be a little bit, um, indicate that it well could be a little bit overweight. For the last one, okay, it is a little bit more on a, uh, it does rely a little bit more on breed. For example, a greyhound is very obvious, super deep chested, super thin body, okay. A uh, basset hound is also obvious, because they're quite low, still chest, but the tummy tuck may not be as obvious as a greyhound, okay. Um, the, for the first two, for the first two criteria of touching the ribs and looking on the top, you can pretty much apply that to all species really. They should all have a chest and a waist, and we, you should all be able to feel it on the sides. And sometimes they are super fluffy, so don't 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 just uh, look at it, feel it, because sometimes uh, it's all just fluff, and you can feel oh, the bones is very easily felt, but you can't really see the ribs from a distance. Yeah, so body condition score. Once you get that three things, that weight is the right weight. Okay. So certainly when you go to your vet and you ask them, um, so how much should my dog weigh? Okay, and sometimes they will give you some useful things. They say, okay, look, listen, your body condition score right now for your little puppy dog is 6 out of 9. So right now it's 27 kilos. 
maybe less than into it's 25 kilos. And it's 25 kilos again, we fill again, and we find out whether that's the right thing. So that is that is the that is the answer behind for that individual dog already. But what we do not want to sort of uh, say is that all Labradors should weigh X amount. Some are tall, some are short. Different. Yeah, so body control score is the way to go. Weight is just a number. We all weigh different, but we all perfect, look at this. perfect shapes. Yeah, all weighing different, but it's great. Yeah. Next paper, which I thought was quite interesting. This is the Royal Society of Open Science. 2019, fairly recent, September um, last year. Wolf-like or dog-like, a comparison of gazing, not grazing, gazing behaviour across three dog breeds tested in their familiar environments. Okay, I'm going to read out a little bit. Okay, so human-directed gazing, okay, a keystone of dog-human communication, has been suggested to derive from both domestication and breed selection. Okay, the influence of genetic similarity to, wolf, uh, to wolves and selective pressure on human-directed gazing is still under debate. So here we use the unsolvable task to compare three different breeds. First one is a Czechoslovakian wolf dogs, okay, or uh, yeah, uh, a close to wolf breed. Second one is German Shepherds, fairly close as well, but fairly common in our lives. Third one is a Labrador Retriever, <laughs> nobody ever considered that as a wild dog. Okay. <laughs> so in this solvable task, all dogs learn to obtain the reward. So basically what they do is they give the dog a treat. Okay. However, differently from um, German Shepherds and uh, Labrador Retrievers, the wolf dogs rarely gaze at humans, even giving the treat. They don't look at a human, they just come and take the treat. Okay? In the unsolvable task, okay, the wolf dogs gaze significantly less towards humans compared to Labrador Retrievers, but not to uh, German Shepherds. So the unsolvable one is interesting. So basically they got two people giving treats. One is the owner, one is a stranger. Okay, so the solvable task is the owner giving, the unsolvable task is the stranger giving. Okay? So, what they, say, what they can see is that um, although all the dogs were similarly motivated to explore the apparatus, i.e. the food, okay, the, the, dog, uh, the wolf dog and the German Shepherd spent a large amount of time in manipulating the food compared to the, lab, uh, the Labrador Retriever. Okay? <laughs> a clear difference emerged in gazing the experimental versus owner. The wolf dogs gazed preferentially towards the experimental unfamiliar subject. Okay? Manipulating the food. German Shepherds towards their owners, Labradors, to both. <laughs> so basically, uh, independent of their level of familiarity, is that I don't know you, but you're giving me food, you're good. <laughs> okay. So in conclusion, it emerges that the artificial selection operated on the wolf dogs produce a breed more similar to ancient breeds, more wolf like due to less intense artificial selection, like the German Shepherd. Uh, and not very human oriented compared to Labrador. So I thought it was a very interesting paper. <laughs> okay, this paper is a 2017, so still fairly recent. Raw meat based diet influences the fecal biomicrome, the microorganisms, the bacteria, okay, uh, and end product of fermentation in healthy dogs. Okay, so what they found was that the aim of the study was to investigate in dogs the influence of a raw based diet supplemented with vegetable food on the fecal uh, microbiome in comparison to a dry food, extruded food. Yep. Okay. A decreased proportion of uh, lactobacillus, uh, paralactobacillus and uh, privitella gener uh, genera was observed in the RNBD group, in the, 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 the raw food, in comparison to the dry, uh, the dry food group. So the raw food uh, diet significantly decreased the fecal score, much less poop, okay, and increased the lactic acid concentration of the feces incorporated in the dry food. Okay, this result suggests that the diet composed, uh, the, the diet composition does modify the fecal microbiome composition and products and the, and the end products of fermentation. Less poop or more poop. Okay, the if you, when we give raw food, it promotes a more balanced growth of bacterial communities and a positive change to the redox of the healthy gut function compared to the dry food. Okay, so all these different bacteria over there. It's all the not so good bacteria, okay, which they found much less when they actually give a raw food diet. So in this paper, it says that giving raw food is good because it actually helps your gut to do more with the right bacteria and not so much of the wrong bacteria 
okay, uh, it's a bit more natural, we produce less poop. So in general, this whole less poop thing, and it's just my two key words, is that if you think of it, if you give a dog, say, 100 grams of food, and it poops out 100 grams of poop, what can we differ from that? <laughs> Not much went into the dog. <laughs> okay? If it poops out, you give 100 grams of food, and it poops out 20 grams of poop, less poop, we can sort of, just by logic, a lot of it went into the dog. Does it make sense? So, usually, just in terms of, well, most owners, they like convenience of it, really. Pick up less poop is always better, <laughs> so to speak. Okay, but in theory, if you think of it, you know the dog produces a lot. You know, I've plenty of owners who come in to say that. Oh yeah, it's pooping fine. It produces a lot five times a day. I'm like, how much are you feeding? <laughs> Why is everything coming out? Is anything going into the dog? Like, oh yeah, I didn't feed a lot. They say, okay, arguably, uh, whatever nutrients you're giving, a lot of it may not be in the dog. That's why it's all coming out. It's not necessarily a good thing. Whereas if you have, well, if you have hundred percent efficiency. You give 100 grams, nothing comes out. <laughs> Obviously, you'll never achieve that. This is just wrong. But if you think of it that way, then you can sort of gauge what sort of food is suitable for your dog. Yeah? Does that make sense? Okay. My last paper. Uh, that record, two years ago. So, zoonotic bacteria and parasites found in raw meat-based diets in dogs and cats. Okay? Zoonotic means spreading to humans. Bacteria, bacteria, parasites, little bugs. So, Feeding raw feed, uh, raw, raw meat-based diets like RBDs, okay, to companion animals has become increasingly popular. Since these diets may be contaminated with bacteria and parasites, they pose a risk uh, to both animal and human health. The purpose of this study was a test for the presence of zoonotic bacteria and parasitic pathogens in a Dutch commercial um, raw meat diet. Okay, they analyzed 35 uh, commercial frozen raw meat from eight different brands. They found E. coli was isolated from eight products, 23%, and extended spectrum beta lactonase uh, producing E. coli was found in 28 products, 80%. So they found all these different sorts of bacteria in 20 and 80% of the food. Okay? They also found listeria was present in 54% in 19 products of it, and other listeria species in 15 products is 43% of it. Salmonella in seven products is 20%. Okay? So concerning parasites, they found four products containing a uh, sarcocytes, uh, which is a uh, little cyst, it's a little parasite, it's a little protozoa that can affect us. And another four, uh, 11% of a, yep, of uh, the same cyst, but a different uh, uh, genre, okay? Uh, last but not least, they found in two products, they have found that toxoplasma uh, was found. So toxoplasma, if you are not familiar with it, causes abortion. It is usually found quite commonly in uh, cat poop and sheep poop, which is why it's not uncommon for pregnant um, uh, women to be advised not to be handling cat poop or sheep poop, even for the vets or nurses. Let's be mindful about that. So they found that as well, but it's <coughs> much smaller. So the results of these studies demonstrate the presence of potential zoonotic pathogens in frozen, uh, and this frozen, okay, fro frozen raw, raw feed that may be a possible source of bacterial infections in pet animals and if transmitted, pose a risk of human beings. In non-frozen meat, if non-frozen meat is fed, okay, parasitic infections are also possible. Okay? So freezing does kill some parasites, but not all of it. Okay? So pet owners should therefore be informed about the risks associated with feeding their animals uh, raw feed. This is just a paper. Okay? There are plenty of papers out there that pros and cons, just like how if you want to dig, you can dig almost a lot of evidence for whatever you believe in. Okay, so I'm just presenting this just as a balance. So it is there.